a very good morning to all of you present over here. I, Ishwa Arora, on behalf of entire Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, welcomes you all in the academic journey of Dr. Sula Jain. Before starting with this insightful session, I would like to call up Dr. Ajit Ranari to kindly felicitate Dr. Sula Jain with a bouquet. I would now like to call upon stage Ashwin Kare, one of my friends who is very enthusiastic and excited to meet Dr. Sula Jengre. He has just brought a small gift for him. Thank you, Ishwa, and uh, good morning to all of you. And I am again delighted and privileged to welcome Dr. Sula Jengre uh, to Gokhale Institute. Uh, you know a lot about him, but maybe some tidbits I would like to mention. I don't want to take time in uh, describing his uh, entire bio. You know, he's described as a journey from Nandev to Harvard. He's currently postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, uh, where he's associated with the Department of African Studies as well as the Kennedy School of Government. He's actually a lawyer also by training. He holds a PhD. He's worked in four continents, Asia, Africa, Europe, and America. What you may not also know that um, First of all, his book, Cast Matters, sold out in one month. And I, of course, repeated editions is, are, are coming. Uh, he's also co-author of a book called um, The Radical in Ambedkar, 2018, I think. And uh, also, he was nominated for the highest literary prize in India the, from the Sahitya Academy. And more interestingly, for at least the young, all the young guys here, he's been named among the top 25 youth icons by Gentleman's Quarterly, GQ magazine. So, uh, please welcome Dr. Sula Jengre. We will be in conversation with uh, our own Dean, Dean Prashant Bansori. As Suraj, you know, he's uh, uh, our uh, sort of distinguished professor in, in sociology. He sometimes describes himself as a lone sociologist here, but uh, he's also a Dean of uh, Faculty. So, I hand it over to you now. Thank you. I think just before moving on uh, for this session, I would like to first introduce Dr. Prashant Bansori. So, Dr. Pishan Bansore is currently a professor at Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. He is presently teaching economic sociology and social exclusion and inclusive policy. So, I would like to tell you that uh, social exclusion and inclusive policy has been currently introduced in Gokhale Institute. And there is a batch size of 152 students who is pursuing this subject and I am also one of them. So, we would like to thank Gokhale Institute for providing us with this insightful and great subject. And definitely have a great contribution to it, sir. So, before moving forward, I would also like to mention a few of the articles that Bansura sir has written and I know most of you are aware of the same. So, he meant, he actually wrote one of this Navyanan Buddhism from Self-Enlightenment to Critical Social Engagement in Sarah Jembridge and Ulrich Rigel. Also, some of his articles that he has contributed to is basically Dalits and the Politics of Inclusion in a City, The Housing Question. Ambedkar Education and the Dalit Emancipatory Trajectory, Education India Journal, a quarterly referred journal of dialogues on education, Stigmatization and Exclusion of Tribal Kumari Matas in Yavatmal Economic and Political Weekly, and Caste Conflict in Maharashtra Economic and Political Weekly. Now, it's also time to just give a short introduction, though our Vice Chancellor has already introduced Dr. Suraj Yengre, but I would just like to formally introduce himself, him again. So, Dr. Suraj Yengre is one of the India's leading scholar and public intellectuals, named as one of the 25 most influential young Indian by GQ Magazine and the most influential young Dalit by Z. Suraj is an author of the best-seller Caste Matters and co-editor of award-winning anthology The Radical in Ambedkar. Caste Matters was recently featured in the prestigious best non-fiction books of the decade list by The Hindu. Caste Matters is being translated in even seven different languages. Suraj holds, holds a research associate position with the Department of African and African American Studies. Suraj's recent appointment was senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, a non-resident fellow at the Hudson Center for African and African American Accountability at Harvard University. He has studied in four continents, as so mentioned, Asia, Africa, Europe, and North America, and is India's first Dalit PhD holder from an African university. 
Originally from Nandit, he has an international human rights attorney by qualification from India and the UK. Surat's forthcoming books are A Cast A New History of the World by Ellen, by Ellen Lane. Also, Suraj has worked with leading international organizations in Geneva, London and New York. He is a co-convener of Dalit Black Lives Matter, Synopsis and the Dalit and Black Power Merchant. He runs a monthly Ambedkar lecture series at Harvard. He is an associate editor of Southern Journal of Contemporary History. I would now call Dr. Prashant and start the session. Thank you. So, uh, formal you know, welcome to all you on behalf of the Institute of Politics and Economics. So, uh, uh, the session is organized in this way that uh, we're going to have uh, uh, first uh, your take on uh, your academic journey uh, uh, as such, and then uh, ten, 10 minutes each session uh, on some important issues uh, that mm -hmm. you are dealing in, in your research. Correct. And then we open it for QA, maybe for uh, 40, 45 minutes at the end. So uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, this is also my interest area, you know, caste and Ambedkar, you know, especially. Uh, when I saw you first, uh, I mean, on the net and all, uh, you just look like, you know, one of my favorite singer, you know, Bob Marley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the redemption song, so, uh, which is more associated with, you know, freedom and em exactly. emancipation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I would request you know straight uh, to you uh, to talk about your academic journey and your intellectual you know kind of influences and uh, and upbringing as a scholar and uh, how do you locate yourself uh, as an uh, not only as an Ambedkarite scholar but uh, a scholar who looks from you know India from outside so maybe your thank you so much. Uh uh, Gokhale Institute. Um, uh, I'm going to get into Q&A, but Ajit had a great idea. He said, why don't I address at least for 10 minutes so we can set the stage and then we can get in conversations. I want to appreciate uh, the, the trustees of the institution who run this, more importantly, Vice Chancellor Ajit Ranade for reaching out. Um, one of the reasons I did not do any engagements with education institutes was because it just becomes, you know, if, you, if you do it one, then you have to, you know, kind of appreciate everything else, but uh, with, with, with the kind of uh, intention Ajit had reached out, I could not say no, because he was really interested. He wanted me to come and speak to his students and faculty, uh, and I think it's to his credit uh, that I could make this time and this morning for all of you. So let's give it up to, for Ajit for, for making this uh, attempt. Um, also, I would like to mention Dean Prashad Bansode, whose work has been phenomenal, has now recently been undertaking a field work in Maratwada to study the landless laborers, which is a very important kind of fact that, that, that kind of uh, escapes our understanding. Um, thank you also to the, uh, to the, to the host and, 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 and all of you for, for coming here. You know, when I was coming here, I was thinking um, the greatness of, of course, Gokhale, uh, not because, you know, Gokhale is, is, is great, but just because of you know Gokhale's importance and especially participation in in then imperial economic kind of interventions he did and that led me to think about because you know we know that <coughs> Ambedkar himself uh, you know we, we call him economist and yet very little of his economic study is undertaken so I am taking this opportunity to invite you to please uh, please scour through then economic models theories um, and, and 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 the reports that are available and, and, and provide a, an, an interesting critique of Ambedkar's economics, his books, his studies, whatever he did in economics. Unless and until we do that, we are just going to confine and we're going to escape the academic acumen of Ambedkar to just mm. one or two facets, which either he wrote a constitution or he's somebody who worked for social cause. But you know, we, should, we should realize an academic who has not only had, you know, public finance was his one of the, you know, fiscal monetary policies, what he was interested in. And it's very, it's very, it's very telling that Dr. Ambedkar, when he was at Columbia, his, his influences were wide. You know, we, we have many names, John Dewey Clark and so forth. Uh, but, but one of the, uh, one of the intimate uh, uh, influences was uh, Seligman, Edward Seligman, again, the great economist himself was a, somebody who's dealing with monetary policy. 
and and Ed Seligman and you know they were had good relations and we are now able to unearth uh, uh, records of Dr. Baker then when he was a student of uh, uh, Seligman and his papers what Ambedkar was you know so the, we have little kind of uh, exposure but more importantly you as scholars and academics and since you dive and delve into uh, public uh, policy with regard to economics I think th th this field is so so uh, so inaccessible to person like me so so I would I would really invite you to really uh, you know uh, get into what Ambedkar was trying to say especially in his evolution of provincial finance in India or what he even wrote ancient Indian commerce these are all his his, his actual academic works uh, you know the, the thesis he wrote on caste in India was one of his side courses he took that was not his core study his core study was what he was engaging with with much of economic kind of uh, retentions and you know I, I was very impressed to to see uh, you know when he was you know especially Maharaja Sayajirao Gaikwad has given the scholarship for him to study economics uh, finance and sociology and so 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 when you know Dr. Ambedkar, when he is there, what he is studying is he, he is studying administration and finance of East India Company because that's then the ruling company. And so he's and, and, and then he just doesn't limit to that. Then he thinks about how taxations, you know, tax is one of the uh, core concepts and interests of Dr. Ambedkar. And, and then he thinks about how fiscal policies are designed in a way that, and, and of course, Dr. Ambedkar goes through the old records of 18th, 19th century especially looking at East India company records and one of the best places to do was to being in London and that's why you would know he went to London of course uh, to, to pursue his another doctorate because he found data and you know British library was uh, you know any economist or any researcher if they are able to get data that's like you know uh, getting uh, uh, getting the Aladdin's lamp so you can find mm -hmm. so much you know so he found that and of course he made many friendships and, and so forth so um, in, in addition to uh, it, to that, uh, what what I think is, um, Dr. Ambedkar is also thinking about how taxation regime regulates the agrarian economy, and he's thinking about farmers, mm -hmm. and that's why he's talking about holdings, the issue of holdings, and, and how redistribution of financial resources, especially taxation, is important. And so, of course, he writes this another thesis called National Dividend, and he looks at how dividend fiscal policies are working in India, and and so, whatever I am able to comprehend with Ambedkar's economic understanding was somebody he was dealing with the then theories. Now I was, you know, I've written this also uh, in, in, as a, in my foreword to the book Ambedkar in London which just came out a few months ago and I was mentioning that Ambedkar's economic status is somebody that's not really presented to us and this is because mm. uh, this uh, halo around Ambedkar's personality became so bigger that his scholarly acumen had become smaller. And mm. so we need to, this is our responsibility, to bring out the scholarly acumen, especially concerning economic discipline. And so many of your students, scholars, and you know, who have great careers, if you could take some of these topics and, and, and really work with, and you don't need to work with, you know, and, and you might, and, and guess what? You might disagree with him, and that's what we want. You might agree with whatever it is. Methodologically, he might be sound. Whatever it, outcomes you might bring, it will be a great contribution to understanding. Because the reason I'm saying is, he was India's first person to study economics abroad and have degrees abroad. Mm -hmm. So he's India's first. So at least for the national pride, you ought to go and dig deep into this guy whose contributions are then defining the monetary economics of this country. And we know his report was eventually uh, instrumental in the constitution of the reserves where he had mentioned about gold standards which was very controversial then but it was ad adaptable and, and reserve bank of india how it, how, how it how it was established and we we have we have known but we have known this through a popular history we don't know through uh, through let's say reserve bank of india archives how does this came about or, or even looking at other state bank or other banks how did dr ambedkar featured in this because his his another thesis that he worked and, and later republished published was the problem of rupee now, problem of review when he when he was studying for reading for a doctor of science, which is another doctorate in, in London School of Economics. What what he is what he is trying to uh, come to terms with is 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 how uh, 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 the the kind of status of economics is is, is changing, and and through that problem, uh, what what he does is he centralizes. Uh, not only the, the the idea of currency, but also how currency is devalued in international markets. Mm -hmm. And for that, you have to understand, rupee was not just the currency of India when British was ruling during that time. It was also currency in many parts of the different world, where it were not always. For example, East Africa, we know the shillings that the currency they have. Prior to that, it was rupee. 
So when Dr. Ambedkar is writing about this question, he's just not writing uh, to, uh, to the Indian geography per se. He's also very much invested in other geographies that have this empire. And so a scholar or anybody who is working during that time is part of a commonwealth. Commonwealth mean, meaning all the uh, common nations that the British had their, their control on. And, and I think that's why, you know, um, I, I want to, I want to, I want to uh, also think about um, the, the, the new structures of uh, economic uh, uh, policies that were designed by colonized as well as post-colonial, how post-colonial economics kind of came about. And, and that's why uh, Ambedkar's thesis, which, were, which I was mentioning about DSC, was, 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 to, was to look about how the finance especially of the imperial government, which he called the, uh, the provincial decentralization of uh, uh, imperial finance in India, which was, of course, later published in different languages. Now, now, now if, if, if you think about this gravitas of Dr. Ambedkar's, uh, what you will definitely find is that there have been important interventions. So all I am saying through my, this long banter is to, is to urge you to help us foreground some of these understandings. Um, uh, and, and if you would if you'd like to go and do research in London or New York, whatever it takes, do that. You know, uh, uh, appeal to whatever it takes. So we just have this solid theory. And I asked this uh, one scholar who was at Princeton now, uh, who, who was studying uh, 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 Dr. Ambedkar's economics, at least very fairly, if not central question. And I said, what happened? Why did you not, uh, like, why don't we know about him? And then he said, Ambedkar was dealing within the debates of Keynesian models that were existing then. And, and that was very unpopular later. But also his arguments, he said, uh, were, now, were now bygone, were not now important, that's why. So even though tell us that, like this is where uh, his limits are, this is how he couldn't uh, work with it. And, and in, his, in his personal biographies, we know he wanted to revisit his three important theses that, thesis that he wrote on, on economics and, and finance. But, you know, as you know, if you have to rewrite something or, or revisit, you have to update the data. And he just didn't have time to scour through the numerical mm -hmm. numbers. So I think, I think, I th I think with, with, with this, you know, um, we, we, should, we, should, we, should, we should think that how much of a diverse location that Dr. Ambedkar brings to us. And Dr. Ambedkar, not just because he's belonging to Dalit or, or, or community or so, uh, uh, don't limit to that kind of appreciation. What we would like to do is we'd like to improvise the Ambedkar understanding because many Dalit followers of Ambedkar uh, couldn't take on this task. They did in their own uh, liminal ways because they didn't have enough resources and access to all of that. And you know, they were first generation going to London and doing research would have been uh, would have been unthinkable if you are just coming out of your dungeon and trying to make it through. But there are many people, and oftentimes we have seen popular economic theories attributed to Ambedkar. We don't know if that is true. If some economist is saying that, we need citations. I asked, Dr. I asked Professor Amati Sain because it's often he said that Ambedkar is my economic guru and all. I said, did you say that? He didn't reply. He didn't say yes. He didn't say no. So I wanted to kind of understand more because there is often attributed uh, to, to, to great personalities. And, and, and you, know, you, need, you, need not, you need not always have Ambedkar being a patron of every other move in India. He can be limited. And, and if he can be limited, that's great because that's the kind of gap we ought to fill. That's your job. If everything is done there, then there's no move. We can't mm -hmm. add a comma to the Quran that is already made. This is not, this is not the, the textual evidence we need to have. And for your scholarship to develop, your subject needs to be so re regally and thoroughly examined that mm. the subject should not be a moment of devotee uh, or, or, or somebody that can have a, a, a beyond respect attitude and attribute. You ought to put your subject to a more stricter scanner. And that's why in, in this comparable sense, Gandhi really comes out as somebody who's willing to self-criticize, who is willing to go through this. And of course, Gandhi has the support of an entire government, an entire machinery, an entire international scholars as well, who, who, who can do that for him. But for unfortunately, Ambedkar, we have not had that, especially across the board. And so, so, so please take this as a welcoming challenge, a, a good task for you, especially for your discipline. You know, and, and, and how, you know, Ambedkar's economics is just not, you know, creating a, 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 a thesis for the sake of becoming a doctor, getting a job. He's trying to actually proactively, directly engage in changing and ameliorating the policies that are running within the imperial India. So I think this is a great kind of move. And you can think of yourself as somebody who, when takes on this task, can 
phenomenally change the structures that you see are unequal in society. Thank you. I think uh, the the uh, tone of uh, you know this interaction is being quite you know well set and. Uh, Dr. Suraj has uh, dwelled on, you know, w w what are the uh, things and uh, issues uh, which uh, the young, uh, you know, scholars and especially, you know, sc scholars belonging from the marginalized origin should take up as an economist and expand, uh, criticize and expand on uh, Ambedkar's, uh, you know, writings. So. Uh, uh, um, maybe uh, we, we have some uh, one or two questions focused yeah. sharply on this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then, uh, actually, while you are talking about you know economics, uh, you know there is a sociologist here. So <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where? So uh, uh, so I was thinking that uh, how do I, uh, how do I uh, see Ambedkar as a sociologist? Okay, uh, uh, although you know I I find you know uh, Ambedkar as uh, one of the uh, leading, you know, sociologist in terms of its uh, exposition on caste and theory of mm -hmm. caste. So, uh, which I'll, you know, come to that later. But uh, uh, we can open this up for one or two focused, you know, sharp questions, which you know Sh Suraj would like to mm -hmm. answer it, and then uh, maybe we have some themes and then discussions over it. Thank. So, um, how do you locate, uh, you know, Ambedkar? Uh, as an economist and uh, uh, one who is critical of uh, the development paradigm uh, which uh, which is set you know uh, in the post independence period uh, because you know definitely ambedkar had a stand uh, whether it should be a mixed economy or uh, you know what is your take uh, on it thank you um you know, I'm still, I'm still trying to evolve because when I was looking through his, I mean, you know, um, one of the um, important uh, changes that the uh, uh, imperial government did after 1857 revolt, which of course didn't last, it went on, was to then create a kind of local finances so that they can be assimilated easily. So then there is a kind of a appreciation of the of the, of the trade tax that people are paying. Erstwhile, it was not like that. It was only a particular a group of people uh, who, 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 were, who were involved in this. And I think from 1870 onwards, we see a proactive engagement from the, from the state, from the imperial government, to think about how to, how, to, how to make, because India by then really had become their crown jewel. They were really uh, uh, drawing uh, enormous uh, tax monies. And you know, their, their important trade, of course, was cotton. That was, that was very, very famous. And of course, uh, sugar cane, sugar that worked with it. And of course, there was other trade that they were, other merchandises that they were, uh, they were, they were dealing with. But but I think um, um, how to how to how to how to make revenue uh, serve in the interest of the public. Mm. That was that was one of the, and that's why we see the program that they create. But Dr. Ambedkar said this is insufficient. I mean, you know, the, the way you are, you, the way you are charting out your own path does not correspond to the larger public agenda. I mean, of course, it's the coffers yeah. that are London banks are sponsoring many things. In today's context, if you look at how America would think about economy, I mean, you know, um, we, we have to appreciate the fact that, uh, I, I don't know if this is an economic term, uh, but at least it's, it's a very much sociological term that his, his economics was more about, he worked in two ways. When India became independent, he wanted India to, to, of course, a new country needs support. It needs finances. It needs a concrete money for development. So the development of, of the nation, that's where it differed with Nehru uh, because Ambedkar mm -hmm. wanted India to look towards West. And because he said it's very practical. They have technology. They have the money. And it's better you ally with the West, take their money, and then work for yourself. Of course, Nehru, Nehru was a diehard social, especially on the left wing side. And he wanted to rely on Russia and China, especially Russian five-year planning. And Dr. Ambedkar criticized that. And he, that's why he said, I wanted the development ministry so I can yeah. work this out. Now, that's one thing where, where one might say, oh, he's trying to move to, you to a certain capitalist duels. And, you know, um, but, but if you look at it, mm -hmm. every country that has become independent, especially in the last century, they have had to rely on their former colony, coloni, uh, colonial uh, 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 regimen or they've had to, you know, uh, draw many loans and most of the time it was the uh, 
uh, their immediate uh, uh, colonizer who had who they had to rely to really settle this up because the system was existing one day they were here and the next day they were gone kind of situation mm. ambedkar in addition to having uh, that viewpoint he also was a very committed socialist who mm. who recognized now this 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 I don't know if this is a term that that exists in the economic parlance or economist parlance, uh, but he was somebody who believed who was deeply democratic in his exercise. Mm -hmm. And for him, democracy can be also injurious if it's not conditioned. And so, how do you do that by mm -hmm. by adding the the phase of of uh, of socialism? Now you have to realize his teachers were Fabians. Now Fabians were somebody who said who were not even liberals, who were not even socialists, but someone who said we can rely on change as an evolutionary aspect of society so they would say change is going to come it's going to follow but when it's going to follow it has to follow certain protocols it need not change the way and so you have to make an active intervention sometimes it, you might also have to twist the arm of the person but that might not always work in the conditional favor and that's why lse london school of economics is really the uh, the uh, the penultimate if not the ultimate uh, 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 citadel of feminist kind mm -hmm. of policies. So many people, and there's a big debate, which Ambedkar was really a, a Fabian uh, thinker, especially because Seligman himself was a known Fabian and who was under his influence. And you know, when you are working with your mentor, if you're influenced, and they say at mm -hmm. some point, John Dewey could be attributed to that. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but in London School of Economics, the, the founder who was a, who was, who was a, who was a great, uh, great speaker, um, 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 his name will come to me in, 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 in a short while, uh, um, uh, who, who, of course, who regulated the Fabianist thought, uh, was also present there. And people say that he appreciated Ambedkar giving a speech on India and something like that. So, so I think Ambedkar would certainly look around the hybridity of this. Mm. Uh, in, in a way, that would, not, that would not create deep inequalities. Mm. So, so how can you utilize an existing system to make... Uh, but you know his classic thesis on socialism is of course state socialism st the, the idea of, of states and minorities but also constitution comes across as such which mm -hmm. gives us opportunity to work in various models that we have yeah sydney web sydney yeah. web that's correct that's yeah. correct yeah very focused uh, 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 economic policy he was thinking of the rural uh, approach and all these things uh, he was against uh, nehru uh, this thing development plan also so how we ambedkar uh, will come as this thing you relate to that. He was towards village economy and agriculture based and employment based, and no, not so very industrial development like that. I think you know, if 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 you look at, I think Gandhian model has failed, especially in mm. in the in the model that we are dealing with in today's economic mm. ideas, because the whole reliance and that was a great idea. And by the way, that was not original Gandhi's. There was a Scotsman. I am missing his name who said, who celebrated villages of India, who looked at agrarian economy, the kind of self-fulfillment. But what has happened is the virtues of, uh, uh, of, of agrarian economy was deeply unequal by, to, to begin with because there was an entire population that had, that had to rely on someone else that, so that they, they can be fed. So the economic model of Gandhi's, though appreciable and nationalist in a sense, in a broader what we call today's liberal and expanding globalized economy cannot rely on that. What it does is, and especially it's, it's, it's a lesson for India. In Europe, the, 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 the differences before industrial revolution was surrounding the feudalist economy, where feudalism was at its height. And that's why people welcome industrialization, because they thought this kind of new machine, where you don't have a boss immediately uh, whipping you, will, will create. But of course, that also was continuation of the social structure. So in Indian context, when Gandhi relies on the, 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 the village uh, 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 agrarian models, what he celebrates is that we could almost think about kind of a barter reliant system. Where, and this, is, this sounds great. If, if you think about the moral ethic of this concept, it sounds great. Like I will, I am producing this and I will rely with you on this and I am producing this and I am relying on this. But already about 102 or 3 generations in, it was never that case. The person who was relying on other person was considered the despicable untouchable. As somebody who doesn't have the status 
to ask for something that demands as an equal compensation. So the compensation was never paid in what it requires to be if, uh, in, in money or something. They were already paying you in a form of pittance by making you rely. And that's why Ambedkar was anti-village. He wanted you to go to uh, modernity, seek out the new places, not just because it was going to be like immediately liberatory, but at least he thought this will provide us an alternative option. Now, let me tell you that though Ambedkar also was someone who was related in the idea of co-shared villages. What that means is he wanted uh, villages, amid, uh, the idea of village republic that Gandhi then eventually took from the Scotsman was something that we could have a, a villages that could be self-sufficient. But Dr. Ambedkar said, how can a village be self-sufficient when the minority group is still relying and then as, as a response to their appeal for something fair in, in return, they are getting beatings, they are getting violence, they are getting atrocities. And today if you go to villages, it is not changed. It's still mm -hmm. the same. If you go in villages, and this, ha this happens in almost any village if you go, is if you ask for some name, then they will ask you, what kind of person is that? They want to find out what location and then they will direct this is this or you go this way. So villages are already segregated. They have this cesspool of casteist uh, behaviors that don't get policed because even there, in, at least in Maharashtra, they have police patil who again happens to be belong to the dominant caste, doesn't have the, the gumption or, or, or the interest to do it. But Ambedkar said, if you really want to work in village economy, let us then create separate settlements separate villages, majority comprising Dalits. So then they can have their own rural agrarian economy and then if you want to have a, a person from dominant caste because should there be a, a relation of business and commerce, mm. at least they will have their own resources to trade with, with other people. They will not be lying. They will be cultivators. They will be owners of their own produce and then they can act as somebody who are acting as mediating agents and not as subordinated people who are subjugated to this and this idea, he said, if in future there is a conflict, at least there will be a war between two villages. It will be about two equals. Not that a dominant person, majority, is going to harass a minority which is relying. And this is what happens in every village pogrom that, that happened against Dalits. You pick up any incident that has happened where there was a communal caste violence, Dharmapuri and so forth, where entire village... These were the people who were landless laborers or people who were relying on their oppressors. And the oppressors at every motion of their trying to seek equality, countered it and killed them, literally, brutally killed them. Entire kids, family, burned them, burned them to the ground. This was a reality that Ambedkar was not willing to compromise. Now Gandhi, him being a baniya and having a certain status with the kind of a social capital he would live, would probably enjoy that. And if, if, if you are somebody who is from the dominant caste, might romanticize that concept and it might not do you bad. If you are somebody who has been traditionally owning land, of somebody who had, uh, who had deeds in your name, that's a very good romantic concept to think, good village. But if you think from the perspective of those who are begging mm. to get a job and then in return they are getting the stale meat to eat, this is the reality that nobody can compliment. And so in that context, Gandhi's economics and of course his economics in a broader context to a national sentiment could certainly befit the sentiments but the modernity the way it was already moving Ambedkar had seen that and he said if it's a social and a kind of economic model let's go towards the, the world where it is moving faster pace now I don't know as every move happens now people are returning to villages now, there is a move at least in the western world people are saying it's enough of cities it's, it's pollution, mm. it's, it, we can't live in a decent housing, uh, we, we can't really have uh, 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 kind of raise our family because it's a cramped apartment and there is a lot of traffic. So there is a move at least in the western world that I've noticed that, that people are actually like willing to work from home or, or work on the farm. Not everybody is doing but there is a move happening. So if that happens, then that opens up a different set of questions as to how the modernity is then catching up with something that is traditional. Gail, Gail uh, it's called liberty, equality, fraternity. Um, and I think uh, two of its aspects are already spoken, so I, I just uh, request you to speak on the third aspect, which she herself speaks of, uh, which is one of the aspects that you spoke, evolutionary model of economy, of change, etc. Uh, second aspect, the Gandhian aspect, and the third aspect she speaks of with relation to Ambedkar was the Marxist. Uh, uh, hmm. So uh, I, j I would just like to, because she has elaborated quite well in her article, uh, where she uh, begins with saying that how, how he has 
uh, sort of initially he was quite in line with the Marxist thought, but later sort of um, started moving away from it. So could you please elaborate? Yeah. And thank you for raising. What's your name? Akshay. Thank you. Harshavardhan. Harshavardhan. Thank you, Harshavardhan. I think, you know, uh, anybody who was studying economics during that time of Ambedkar was certainly entrapped or, or, or embalmed uh, with the new state policy, especially after Lenin took over, after the October Revolution. And so Russia was the new thing, new deal happening. Everybody was looking up to it. And, you know, how they threw up the czars and, you know, the kind of, the kind of uh, what, uh, uh, you know, as I was mentioning yesterday, uh, not only um, uh, uh, Eric Hobson, but many people talk about how this new age was epochal. It was kind of evolving. And then mm. for that, uh, we, we, we have historical citations, especially Ricardo. Um, and, and, and through the model, there was also a, a, a philosophical thought within liberalism also that was trying to catch up. So when we draw the strict binaries, uh, sometimes it's, it's kind of difficult to come to uh, terms with the actual theories because then it no longer becomes the, the theoretical model. It, it, it becomes how can I, how can I, how can I, how can I uh, portend uh, a, a thought that actually belongs to the writer or thinker as opposed to that belongs to the public. Now that's what that's what has happened when any 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 thought that, that has that has come about in, in, in this sense um, when the common turn was formed, the communist international, the idea was to spread this this idea uh, ideals of communism. Uh, in, in many senses. And, and now Marx is somebody who, is, who, who relies on uh, communism and who thinks, and of course, his Das Capital is something that I never understood. It was quite difficult to read, but yet mm. I had to go through it. As a graduate student, you read through it, and of course, you read other Marxist influences. But what com comes out is the central concern remains the poor, the marginalized, and it doesn't say that it's because of your uh, karma and everything. Marx is actually providing you a, a detailed analysis of how the person is oppressed because there is an economic chain, the model that really graduates from a certain style of economic relations to a fixated economic models. And in this, he identifies the proletariat, the peasant, the working class person, and working class doesn't have a kind of a broader grouping. So Marxist theory really also thinks that how do we then overthrow this exploitation? Their reliance is, it's, and, and many people say, it's only economic exploitation, which is not correct. I mean, they are dealing with also social dynamics. It's, the problem is the people who were uh, uh, the purveyors of, of economic models um, didn't want to uh, mess up with the socialized aspect, because that will open up a very difficult box of worms. And that might really uh, create a much more uh, deficiency in, 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 in how we how, 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 we, how we proceed. And you know, David Harvey, for example, when he is providing understanding of Marxist uh, political economy, you know, it's very interesting that, that Marxist new tones are meant to uh, provide uh, a guidance, a constitution to how a new state is to be restructured. And that was very excellently done and executed by Lenin. Lenin had brought in those, I mean, of course, Russia also was, 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 was catching up, but they, they, were, they were developing this, and this was was spread across in different parts of the world and even in India. For example, many people, especially M. N. Roy, uh, who, who established many communist parties, was kind of like thinking about this new move because, of course, the access of knowledge and, and books came about. So Ambedkar, in this sense, when he was catching up the kind of uh, 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 phase of looking at how we should deal with it, Ambedkar is also dealing with the question of how, how a nation state should be formed and that's why his interest is economics because mm -hmm. the whole idea of monetary fiscal policy, the idea of looking at the economics of, of, of a state and then, and, and, and then, and then looking at how, how, how a currency is, is devalued and valued. So what he's doing is he's actually his concern is economics but he's concerned in how the political and economy of the state has to be established. So Ambedkar in that sense is already in sync with this conversation. But he is not necessarily a die-hard Marxist to the sense of the way we understand Marxism. The way we understand Marxism is the, ex the, es the espousal of a certain purist economic theory. And you, we know Marxism has also gone into uh, 100 example different shades because that's how big the thesis mm -hmm. that comes about. But the primary nexus that Ambedkar looked at, you know, you, 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 might, you might know or not, he wanted to write a book, Communism in India, and, and, and to look at how this, and he couldn't finish. But Anand Tel Tumri has written mm. a fantastic introduction in the leftward kind yeah. of unpublished theses. Yeah. So in that, Ambedkar really brings about how the new models have to be realized. And if you look at that, mm. Ambedkar is not necessarily in sync with Marxists. And also for that matter, yeah. Marx. But he is in tune 
with the dimensions that are coming out of the Marxist thought, which is very valuable, which is what he brings. Now we have to think, had there not been Marx, would the new state that we have anywhere in the world, not just in India, would have this concern for social welfare and social uh, 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 policies, kind of social policy centric nation. Probably we might not have had aggressively. So the Marxist influence was very, very sound. Now Marxist theories were something that Ambedkar was not willing to uh, 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 comprehend because of course it said and Marx for his time was thinking not anything than violence can bring justice to the society because if you can keep on petitioning and the poor people don't need to wait for justice because if you can get a justice just pick up the, the axle and just cut the throat and justice is served because there's one guy who's harassing you on the farm who is owning 50 of you people who is who's, who's thrashing you why don't you solve the problem? Just pick up the axle that you're cutting the grass with, put it to his neck, problem solved, 50 of you, redistribute the land and enjoy. That was the power that brought to peasants. Peasants like, can we do that? Like, yes, you can do that. How can you do that? Let us show that. And that's how the new kind of uh, economic model through Marxist uh, vision came about. Ambedkar and Buddha in yeah. that sense. His understanding of Buddha and Marx uh, was not very nuanced and it was not developed. Yeah. He was yet to develop it. That was a speech he gave. And so people always, especially, uh, and, and we don't know the, the back history of how he came about it. He never went to give that speech on that topic. He yeah. went to the, the Nepal's prime uh, king and invited him to speak on Dhamma. Because, yeah. But he was late to that meeting. And so the people were already, uh, the youth were already thinking about Marxist revolution. And so, the, so they said, why don't you talk about this? So he gave a speech during that time. And I'm pretty sure if Ambedkar would have seriously dealt with this topic, which he wanted to, by the yeah. way, and he couldn't, of course, his life was short. But his speech of, of how a, a, a Marx as opposed to Buddha yeah. is contradictory is still very sound, is still very profound, is prophetic. He really, on top of his head, is telling you what Marxism is. And he's not even prepared. You know what I mean? So, he's, so if you can imagine, if you invite me and ask me to speak on something, that I don't have any tinges of idea. I'm just going to shoot in many different angles, or I'm just not going to do it. But Ambedkar, it's 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 the elocution he's given on 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 uh, to to ask him to deliver a speech on spot, hmm. and yet he's so insightful about Marx. <laughs> just proves how much in tune Ambedkar was with Marxist economic and political theory. He was already aware. He of course distilled it in a simplest form. Yeah. Similarly, of course, he could talk about the Buddha, his Dhamma, the values, and Ambedkar said. I will appreciate change, but not at the cost of people's life. I will try to make change a moral project, an ethical project. And he said, it's not that there has not been, there has been a history and this glorious country has seen that change through the birth of the Buddha and the way that he spread the Dhamma. He said, we brought change and we don't have to look any further because Dhamma hmm. offers you that guidance that you can change the, 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 the needle of the, the historical compass that you have. And that's why Ambedkar is very much uh, in sync with his ancestral heritage and legacy. Mm -hmm. His legacy is Buddha. His legacy is the Naga people, the Dravida people, who have given the world whatever cherishing history that India could proffer. So he, he doesn't have to really uh, hustle around for second-hand influences. He has to, and, and that's why he's very much committed to his own people. And that's why I think the kind of a sentimentality of how Ambedkar no, Buddha cannot be nationalistic about it, right? Buddha is about the, the kind of globalist world. So we have to be also be said, you know, careful about that. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> actually, the, the Gale, Gale, Gale talks in terms of uh, how, you know, Ambedkar got uh, disillusioned with, you know, Marxist on the question of caste and yeah. uh, that departure. And most of, uh, uh, you know, she's trying to integrate the uh, perspective of Mapua it's uh, known in Maharashtra, that is Marx fully Ambedkar. and Ambedkar, you know, integrated kind of a perspective to see Ambedkar. Correct. So Correct. On, on, on it. So uh, I hope, uh, uh, you know, I think it's more clear. So uh, any question focused or uh, we can have, you know, the next, you know, theme, which is more close to me, the, that is, you know, sociology and caste. So, uh, uh, and it, it, this is related to your, you know, book. <coughs> uh, uh, it's really very uh, written in a very pro prolific style. Thank and you. I Thank just, you. you know, like, you know, the way you articulated, you know, caste matters. Thank you. And uh, I, I find, you know, it is uh, uh, one of, you know, the revolution on, you know, caste uh, uh, in, in contemporary context. 
uh, which as a, uh, as a teacher, uh, I would like, you know, students to read it as, you know, Arundhati Roy, you know, talks in terms of that, uh, how Ambedkar is more important, uh, rereading Ambedkar, you know, becomes more important and Correct. it is in that line. You know, I, I, I rate your, you know, book in that, uh, Thank you. you know, kind of a light because it's really very uh, illuminating in terms of uh, where, where uh, the space of, you know, uh, to talk on caste has already been shrunk. Hmm. Okay. Uh, not only that, but uh, the caste is, uh, you know, something which is not to be, you know, discussed in public. Okay. Uh, as we have seen that, you know, caste were never, uh, you know, f form part of the Durban kind of a conference, Indian state and even Indian scholars and especially sociologists have their own, uh, you know, stance on whether to take uh, caste Correct. into the Durban conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, contemporary also, uh, you know, sociologists are not acknowledging that uh, 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 caste, you know, still exists. Correct. What they are saying is that... Uh, uh, it is the use and abuse of caste. Hmm, hmm. So it is a, such kind of you know, misleading kind of an uh, articulation uh, uh, of you know uh, that caste is just limited to the use and abuse of it. So uh, I just hmm. want your uh, you know views on on it and how you know it is important. Uh, you know how how does caste matters hmm. uh, in contemporary context? Thank you. And I appreciate your uh, your endorsement of caste matters. Um, the, for example, I mean the, the, the position of sociologists on caste question has always been uh, animating and dynamic, and I think that's 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 how caste is. It's not one tone and one 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 particularity that kind of comes about with it. I would like to you know think of when people are pushing back on the the analysis of caste, especially and you know what what. Uh, 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 Prasha, Professor Bansode was saying. You can say Prashant. Uh, Prashant was saying was that the the uh, the the location of caste can it go beyond the borders of appreciating how it is existing in the world? Especially there was a conference in 2001, Durban mm -hmm. conference, where people were debating whether caste should be debated as a question of race and caste. I mean, I think it was just a different time, and people didn't have enough 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 updated researches and so there was a there was a move that please recognize our humanity because we are also oppressed and it was the united nations conference and and that's when the the whole uh, indian state come, came down upon them and there were two prominent sociologists who really pushed back upon the narrative and they were rightful so they say caste is not race which is which is what <laughs> which is what mm -hmm. it is it is not race it's a different dynamics dipankar gupta and andre bete uh, where where somebody who were who were, who, who who had ensconced uh, the experiences of people as opposed to a pure sociological theory. So in, in their sense, inadvertently, they become, uh, they became and they were very much working as the servants of the state against the interest of the Dalits. And then they didn't realize. And, 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 and for that, they remain uh, very much uh, a, a, a kind of a, how, how, do we, how do we regulate our social education as opposed to our academic education with the cause that we stand for. And then I think this, this kind of social education was somehow, I think, missing in this respect and academic education took a provenance. Now, is, is it right and not? And we really need to uh, experience caste, especially, you know, for example, you know, one of the earliest uh, writings on India's history, especially caste in, in sociological context, uh, was done in, in, in 16th century in, in mm -hmm. Portuguese, you know. They were people who were who were reporting about this, and of course, it was meant to, you know, it was written by the for the for the cardinal. It was it was, it was reported back. It was a project that that they were exploring what to do about this. It was just a new research, but also was meant to see if a potential colony can be established through, of course, religious efforts. After that, Marx really comes out as somebody who studies. Mm -hmm. Many people don't know he wrote on in ancient India history. He talked yeah. about uh, the caste question in India, and of course, by the time he wrote. The capital, that kind of interest was still alive, but didn't really, uh, uh, you know, came about. And it's but Max Weber, for example, yeah. Weberian understanding, you know, uh, especially the, uh, you know, Max Weber wrote on caste. Paria. Uh, uh, yeah. The whole question of Paria. Yes, and also his his thesis of understanding how the Western as opposed to ancient Indian societies was central. And and but prior to that, Hegel was also somebody, a philosopher, was 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 trying to think about the question of you know, and he and he studied uh, Hindu theology. Uh, Hegelian uh, diaries have 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 a profound interest. The reason we mention Hegel is because Marx is somebody then engaging with Hegel mm. for his understanding, and through 
Marx, um, uh, Weber is engaging through this question. But whereas Ambedkar, he comes in, in uh, he, he, he engages with questions, let's say for Ketkar, uh, uh, Sridhar Ketkar, who, who wrote one of the first uh, a classic comparative world thesis, a world comparative thesis on caste is, 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 is Sridhar Ketkar. He went to Cornell. And of course, I think he lived some of his life in Pune, but also in Nagpur. Ketkar's thesis was somebody Ambedkar relied on diligently. Of course, then his, his influences remain with R.J. Bhandarkar, whose institute is here right now. Mm. And, 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 and he wanted to kind of separate as a, a foreigner's interpretation as opposed to uh, somebody who is from India's interpretation. And he makes that clear. He's like, we have two different streams of thoughts and we need to rely. And of course, uh, he does that and eventually. But, but again, Ambedkar is not purist and that's why his position keeps on changing. Yeah. People always want to have that one statement policy as, as to this is finality. It doesn't work like that. Eventually, of course, then Ambedkar relies on, uh, uh, on, on hybridity. Knowledge cannot be confined to color, skin, caste and so forth. It, it needs to come from different streams of thought. Sociologically understanding, Caste was, was understood as a structure, mm. and, 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 but there was a school of thought that said it is also part of culture. Now, what's the difference? Cult structure is something they say, it's the element of society. This is what it is, various institutions, um, various organs of society are the structures. And through that, caste is, is, is present. But there's also debate of culture. And within that kind of a cultural structure debate, a postmodernism kind of kept thinking about it. And this is mostly happens in 19... 30, but mostly 40, 50s onwards. And one of the uh, heroes of this movement was Louis Dumont. Dumont. Uh, yeah. Louis Dumont was somebody who wrote Homo Hierarchus, Homo but also he wrote Homo something else. Uh, uh, kind Homo of like, economics. Uh, 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 no, Homo, uh, there's also two kind of. Homo and, habilis. Yeah. Habilis or something. Yeah. I mean, so he wrote, he wrote kind of two texts. And, 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 then, and of course, he wrote this immense contribution to contribution in Indian sociology, the journal. Yeah. What, what, what Dumont does is, what Dumont, I think, profound Dumont, and many the critiques of that. And, and they are valid and you know, it can continue. Of course, one of the critiques is he is looking through a very orientalist sense what Edward Said was, was, was harking on and I think still it's, it's a very limiting concept when you look at orientalism as opposed to occidentalism because the idea of oriental exists in every sphere but of course looking through the power structures, the other society may or may not be orientalist or not. That's the kind of uh, uh, vision that came about eventually. Dumont was centralizing on the cultural supremacy of this individual. Sorry how a supreme a cultural person is. And that's how we see the both kind of analysis becomes like, think about caste, just not in caste context, but also looks at race and various kind of paradigms that exist alongside. In caste matters, how do you look at caste? How caste matters at the analytical level as well as at the operational level? Mm. Mm. Say that caste matters, so how would Operating you operate mechanism correct, of caste? Correct, correct. Uh, the thing is there is ideology and then there is an, there is an action. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so, uh? yes. So, so you know, one, one, one is you know, uh, one is individual and other is society. That's how we should, we should, we should, you know, individualistically the ideology can exist the way the way it functions. So, caste, for example, in, in in modern context, the way we see in today, especially relying on the historical anecdotes and experiences and archives, we we notice that caste is changing its form but it's not changing its soul. <laughs> what that means is, the soul is, is the same. It might change, it, it might come in different shapes, but the soul is to maintain a strict hierarchy and supremacy of one caste over the other. And with that, it wants to regulate economic redistribution of resources by mm. keeping one group of person permanently reliant on other group of person. And that's why Medkar talks it very effectively. He calls them units. These are these independent units which are working not in cohesion but in opposition of each other. And mind yeah. you, when they are working in opposition of each other, what they are doing is they are not trying to settle a society. They are trying to create alternative societies and that's why each community in India is a caste and mm. each caste is a nation. They have their own rules. They have mm -hmm. their own functions, they have their own gods, they have their own rituals, they have their own kind of intra-community conventions. And if there are so many nations existing within nation, there cannot be one nation. This is Ambedkar's understanding. He said if they have, we have, if they have so many independent uh, countries, and you know what this does? We can call it country, we can call it tribe, we can call it caste. The, 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 the meaning is the same, uh, the, the, the experience is the same, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the theocracy mm -hmm. around this is the same which is that there is, if there is a one group 
it's always going to try to protect its own interest. When they're trying to protect its own interest, it will try to create animosity with other groups because there is not enough resources. And to have access to the resources, you go to warfare. Every day, caste crimes are this intranational crimes that people are committing upon each other because just there is a liminal kind of resource. On public uh, domain, we see ideology is transcended through many ways. And one of them is, let's say, institutes. How many institutes are representative of scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, OBC uh, people? Mm -hmm. And how much of them are overrepresented by minority people? And say, economist, the magazine economist realizes that. But Indian policymakers, even though they realize that, they cannot implement. Let me tell you how powerful the, 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 the structure of caste is existing as opposed to the state. The Indian government, I think two years ago, gave a circular, a strict warning that to IITs that go and fill mm. these positions. Mm. And yet, even today, only 30% positions are filled of reserve categories. 70% mm. still remain vacant. vacant. Now, if you have a mighty state, a and, and, and a government that is ruled by, um, of course, a, a, a numerical majority numbers, there should not be any fear to do this. Yet, the structure is so powerful that even though the message is coming from the top office, they have found excuses to evade the responsibility. That's how practically it takes place. Mm -hmm. You see in, a, in, in everyday interactions, when structure becomes culture, where we, when we then make a common appreciation yeah. of the person who belongs to a certain community as to stereotyping mm -hmm. them, if you live in certain yeah. Dalit neighborhood as opposed to a Brahmin or a dominant caste neighborhood, and oftentimes people who are in the dominant position, they want to reclaim their victimhood because they see somebody having a moral cause of being a victim. Mm. Now, how do I withdraw the morality of your victimhood is by making myself much more bigger victim. So your victimhood just becomes a fake or a narrative. It just becomes a figment of your experiences because I want to port it. And that's why people say, especially conversations regarding reservation or any form, it's, it's impacting us negatively. They are not much interested in, mm. in, in reforming but they are more interested in, in retaining. And I think that's how we see in, in, in today's actual praxis. Yeah. Uh, Akash, uh, Akash. Uh, Akash, Akash, yes. Uh, you spoke about uh, cohesion and position. So for a society to work, you always need certain people doing certain job. So, how would you differentiate cohesion and position? Um, could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, actually, you said, uh, Ambedkar said that uh, different castes are not working in cohesion, mm -hmm. but in position against each other. So, how do you differentiate it? Contradiction how do you tackle that? Uh, okay, okay. Maybe. Yes. People will need certain people doing certain jobs to mm -hmm. have the correct, correct. perfect yeah. system. Precisely. And I think that certain job needs to be done by everybody, not confined <laughs> to one group or one caste. That will create <laughs> much more, uh, um, and, and and I think we have we have, the, and that's what I'm saying. That's how uh, the if if I say uh, that um, the manual scavenger should not be Dalits anymore. That's the question of contradiction. People would like to have sanitation and hygiene, but they would not have the impulse to then think about that if this if this, if this is the kind of uh, structure that is existing in society, there is a problem. But what we do is we not only uh, 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 degrade the labor of that human, but we also justify the existence of that person in that job. And not only on top of that, we have the audacity to backbite and complain about the person who is trying to provide us the most essential services, because that's how it is, it is, it is meant to be dealt with. And, and, and in, 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 in many broader strokes, every morning, uh, what we do is we try to limit our distance from the most filthiest thing that we see is our human excreta. When we are wiping, when we are cleaning after, after, after a morning ritual, we are trying to limit that experience even with our own shit. How do we expect mm. the person from the other group? And for that humanity to come to board, we should start carrying our own shit every day in our hand for at least, I have made this challenge for at least <laughs> three minutes. Let's see how much of that. And once we are able to appreciate that, then we can think about people having a segregated job and the status kind of defined around that line. And it applies to everything. I mean, no person, if you are giving a training to that person for a specific time, you can excel. But this whole attitude of if you are belonging to certain caste, if you are belonging to especially dominant caste, 
the Savarna communities, there is a there is a, 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 a unannounced declaration that they, this must be um, this must be reflective of the merit and the and, and the talent they have. But when it comes to somebody who's from the from the from the marginalized community, it's always meant to be assessed through through numerical lenses. He's doing something wrong, and there's something wrong. It, it's like it's like an arranged marriage system. When when the when the when the woman is coming to into a new house, she's not just by one person and one metric. She is just by everybody in the house through different metrics. And even though she's performing her best, she's trying to provide to the family, yet she's still not succeeding. Because her success is not meant to be appreciated because she's meant to be the she's meant to be positioned as a butt of joke or somebody who, who needs to be targeted. Similar instances we happen when people who are trying to work, they really need to overprove. And we don't need nobody needs to prove nobody. If you have gotten through admission, that's it. If you have gotten through uh, your, uh, your 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 job, that's it. But yet, mm -hmm. every day, a person from the marginalized community needs to prove their worth, their metal, by in, even in normal interactions with their colleagues, their superiors, their mm -hmm. students, they feel the need to show that I'm here because I really am talented, I really am deserving this, I really am a smart person. But person from the dominant class doesn't need to think about that, they just have to just walk in and just declare, I am XYZ community, and their last name will show what Brahman Banya community they come from. And it's an announcement that, oh, this must be smart, even though they might do stupid things. Because our mind has been habituated. That's why I say we need to retrain our mind that certain last name doesn't mean excellence. Hmm. It could mean a process of education and learning. And that's why I invite my Brahmin friends to keep on exposing their vulnerabilities that I am not smart enough. I'm as good as you are. It's just that I've got a certain background. I've been... I've been I've been given an advantage to enormous historical generational privileges that hmm. never meant me. Let me think that I am anywhere lower or inferior. That thought mm. of you being superior is itself a big visa for you to excel in any competition because you're already trained your mind. I'm meant to succeed in this. But if somebody is telling you you're inferior, like most of us undergo that experience, mm. it's very difficult because you're not just challenging yourself, but you also have an entire society that you need to prove. And in that burden, by carrying the load of people's aspirations and, and complaints and the deluge that you are carrying, now you are meant to just climb the wall and fly uh, like a rocket. Mm. You can imagine how difficult it is. And yet people prove their success. And you can imagine how incredibly talented the students and faculties and people who have got jobs and who are surviving are. And I think we should give it up to them who have made it through all this uh, loops yeah. and hope. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, this... Uh, uh, maybe we can take it up uh, later. Yeah. So uh, this, uh, you know, reminds me uh, of uh, the whole question about uh, uh, how egalitarian are our educational institutions, and uh, the whole question about uh, the inclusive character of education, and you know, DV's, you know, kind of you know, uh, democratic, uh, you know, whole idea of you know, democratic uh, classrooms, and you know, things yeah. like that. So, how do you look, uh, you know, uh, as uh, as uh, Suraj uh, Ingde from uh, Nanded, and then you know, positioned in Harvard, mm -hmm. and then uh, relook on uh, the the uh, Indian higher education system, especially where uh, you have cases of you know Rohit Vemula and you know, uh, it's it's uh, continuing, you know, it, it is on. So, uh, uh, what is your take on uh, on the whole notion about uh, democracy, uh, democratic form of education, and then the whole question about uh, egalitarianism and uh, an inclusive character of education? I think it's wonderful. Let's look at this, just the demography. The kids or rather students belong to different castes and communities and religion. I mean, that's the success. That would not have been possible mm. if you were still followed a certain... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, education system where people mm -hmm. of certain caste would only come and they would just educate themselves. The whole purpose of having this secularized common education and this is what I'm more proponent of that mm -hmm. we need people from different communities to have, we, we need what is outside India mm -hmm. should be reflective of what is inside the classrooms, the demography and, and, and the kind of representation. Now it doesn't mean what is outside India, the kind of violence and, 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 mm -hmm. and, 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 and the sad state we are in should reflect in classroom. What I mean is the demographic uh, representation should should be should be present, and democratic ethos is is, is something that needs to be cultivated repeatedly. Mm. You don't learn democratic ethos by just learning in uh, textbooks or casting a vote. 
it's just a very tiny moment of how democracy is practiced. Democracy is a, is a profound exchange based system where you can, we can barter uh, for certain ideals so that you can create a, a, a society that you want to establish because the democratic ethos is to be part of a society. It's not meant to live isolation. If you want to live in isolation, then there are different political models that are existing in society. Democracy means what do we very, very fantastically put it with Dr. Ambedkar picked up was is a means of associated living. Mm. It's not segregated living. It's not meant to be separated and, and diverse, uh, divorced living. It's meant to be associate living. And what associate mm. does? Everybody is equal in association. Association of each other. And mm. you know, you know, Herbert Melville, for example, wrote the concept of how assimilation works. In assimilation, you really become part of a society by becoming neutralized in that. Mm. There is a notion of how association develops while we are in cohesion with each other. Mm. And, and, and this association needs to be then told is not dangerous. We are taught that association leads to disharmony. It might lead to um, a fire. It might lead to a, 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 a demagoguery. This is wrong. Association is a great experience. You think about it. You just look at in one generation or rather two. Now third generation people after independence are trying to look around that aspect of society. Like we need to, yet mm. what we have is neighborhoods segregated by caste. Mm. Colonies segregated by caste. Now that might be people's own interest and we need not comment on now that they might have their own mm. community based society. They want to live in certain ways. But how can people live their true self mm. without having to feel ashamed for their existence? Mm. I want to live the way I want. I want to eat beef, I want to eat pork, I want to eat different kind of food. Why should I be ashamed of what I feel? You want to eat different kind of food. Yeah. Even in simple cultural semantics, we try to reproduce caste hierarchies without even realizing mm -hmm. how bad it has come to be about. And more of the often, it is a lack of education of the other. Yeah. If I know about Prashant, Prashant knows about me, we can develop a relation. Mm. But if I'm assuming Prashant is from a Dalit community, and then he might have something about it and then he might only think 24-7 Ambedkar, he might think 24-7 <laughs> about uh, his own caste and community. It's so wrong. Prashant might have a diverse interest. He might, he might, he might, he might, he might, he might revel in, in the European Renaissance art. He might somebody enjoy the Indian classical uh, 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 themes of, of performances. We can connect on those basics bare minimum. In our family too, mm -hmm. we are not 100% in sync with each other. It will never be a family if everybody is in sync with each other. So how can you expect that purity of a relationship existing in society? There is always going to be contradiction. But what our aim should be, mm. should be the aim of family. We, we know she disagrees in this conversation. As a mother, she also knows the daughter and, and the husband is indifferent. Yet, they want to run the vehicle of family. Mm. Because they have committed to one common project of development, welfare and happiness of each other. If we bring that nature of how to have a family from inside our uh, closed door houses and rooms to a public then we can then come to a common language and I think education yeah. is about that how we reproduce equality not just by mention of having um, saying something but how we really truly invest in this and equality then mm -hmm. becomes a language of democracy. Uh, what Baba Sahib Ambedkar has already expressed in, in caste in India and uh, relation of caste, social endosmosis is very important. Only association, I think, it will not uh, Correct. affect them. Correct. Ah. Absolutely. So, kindly, can you throw yeah. upon this? Let's also take her question. Yeah. Question any, any, anyone? Yes. Uh, sir, uh, you spoke right now about uh, a, pra a practical uh, phenomena in society where the moment you say your name, the surname, the search from your surname of your origins, your caste starts from that moment. I have practical experience of my name not giving any sort of hint of <laughs> from which caste I belong. So I refer back to a statement being made in Annihilation, Annihilation of, of Caste by uh, Dr. Ambedkar where he talked about intercaste marriage being one of the solution what he th thought at that point of time might help the society to uh, bridge the gap between uh, the dominant as well as the uh, uh, a caste who is dependent upon the other one 
I find that my like my name doesn't give an idea, but people definitely once after also asking the name, their quest for search for who are my forefathers, who are what is their name, maybe the paternal side or maternal side to you know gather that information, doesn't end. So it is antithesis to what you were or what I personally believe that the surname should not you know be restrictive to what a person my uh, pre notion that that person might be interested in or their thought processes and all of that but at the same time despite it being the antithesis do you believe that this kind of practice of uh, any sort of surname not giving an idea would help remove the differences between caste Okay, let's take another one also. Uh, what was said earlier about surname giving an indication of caste and that leading to a kind of uh, preconceived notions regarding merit. Hmm. And that you can see extending everywhere. Not, I mean, the presumption earlier what you said of uh, Ambedkar speaking about cities hmm. and Gandhi being more comfortable in the idea of villages. Yeah. Uh, with the, the preconceived notion is that probably in cities are probably because of the force of liberal markets, mm -hmm. uh, caste would have a lesser impact. That doesn't seem to be working out in practice, right? Because you're looking at surname and surname as indication of merit. Mm -hmm. You're making presumptions that of that even in an open market economy, exactly. even in uh, employment, uh, not only uh, in all kinds of situations, in, even in city life. Mm -hmm. My question basically is that if the state, as you said, is incapable or is not being able to implement things like affirmative action and reservations, mm -hmm. even where it is, in a sense, has the, the capacity to do so, which is public universities Correct. and so on. How does the state, and can the state actually, in today's day and, um, day and time, be able to uh, affect the change in this open market liberal economy where a surname is becoming the uh, e equivalent to merit? And uh, even now, because of that, uh, certain occupations are being foreclosed from uh, certain categories of our society. So do you think the state has any kind of a influence on the open market and when it can, cannot even control what's happening in our public universities and public institutions? I think uh, the, f the first point is, 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 is very well taken. Uh, I think uh, uh, we need to understand how the whole idea of endosmosis, it's actually, I think it's a Duvian idea, which basically means, you know, um, we should have much more rigorous, robust engagements, free full of ideas, uh, osmosis, what is osmosis doing is kind of, you know, uh, as opposed to exosmosis, like which is not, in endosmosis is meant to uh, have much more interaction within the own. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a botanical, I think, uh, language. A social endosmosis is where so various social groups should participate uh, and, 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 and develop a new society or, or contribute to making of this society. Um, um, I think the, the two questions uh, are, you know, kind of related that how can state then, you know, function and state then work in this. I think uh, the state already has policies. One of the things is what can state do more, right? Mm. Uh, so we need to create some some difficult steps. The point is, there is an excellent law to protect the atrocities committed upon Dalits. But the, 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 the difficulty is in implementing A and two, mm. Even though it's so strict, it, it just, it, 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 it in, in many sense doesn't create a deterrence. Law is not meant to punish in the mm -hmm. first place. Law is meant to create the deterrence that you will have this fear. That's why we don't commit crimes. But people are overlooking laws which are so strict. If you are convicted under uh, a POA Act, Prevention of Atrocities Act, you might get difficult in getting a bail because that's what it meant to do. It's meant to protect. Yet people take the risk and, and, and go and commit dangerous crimes upon this. So the law is very strict and so what we need to do is probably create an awareness around protection of marginalized communities and make them think that we want to make you, we want to strengthen you, we want to make sure that you don't remain, uh, uh, remain, remain, remain back uh, uh, towards, uh, remain backward uh, towards the, to the bigger goal that we are trying to achieve and, and, and to, to really implement that we probably need to have conversations in each offices, in each campuses, in each places of common, you know, we need to explain to people the importance of how, we, how, how caste is damaging and how caste is dangerous. Now, let me tell you, if we start talking about caste anywhere, people will start talking about their own self first. 
they will talk about their own caste experiences and most often people will have and which is what it is everybody caste is an individual experience but also it's a social and public experience and so but we need to still go and 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 and, and, and press the plug operations for example talking about university campuses there have there has to be a proactive policy countering caste and that means it has to be zero tolerance institutes of course have zero tolerance but we need to also have protection cells where where where, where students can have which should give an authority now let me tell you we have a national commission on uh, on scheduled castes which is a constitutional body if a if a if a ncsc writes a, a letter to a commissioner or whoever they have to immediately act on because it's coming from the highest authority to protect and yet we see incidents like this happening so it's not that the picture is gloomy the picture is that we need to make this an experience an exp experiment of everybody it cannot mm -hmm. be just attributed to shidul caste shidul tribe the education of these groups need to be told other people as well and they need to do it they tell if you do this there might be repercussions and they might say well we are also harassed and stuff like that they might create excuses but that's why we need a more uh, a learning experience as opposed to as opposed to having something that will just create more and more gulfs so people say if you talk about caste might create more divisions the idea is there is already division why not just talk about it and make sure that we can try to reach at common point so it might be a difficult conversation you might have to put yourself under the radar of being somebody who might perpetuate caste and doesn't mean if you perpetuate now and if you realize you might be trying to do something that you might not do in future the same happens with gender sensitization workshops and so forth mm -hmm. if a man constantly thinks that okay by the virtue of it being a patriarchal society there might be certain advantages to you being a male and so what can i do to address this is of course then realize that of course you know if you live in a deeply unequal gendered society you have certain responsibility to address it and so for that it needs really this acknowledgement and confession and that can happen with education if somebody just goes and tells outside a male you are a criminal in the society or you, or you are somebody is committing crime that person mm -hmm. will be like, i'm i'm not i'm not going to deal with this i live in a different society so we need to find those kind of balances and i think that's what a kind of communication is the major problem yeah uh, uh from your book uh, uh, and from your analysis uh, in the the radical in ambedkar so one theme which uh, you know is extremely important and which is close to me as well is the gramscian framework of organic intellectuals mm. and uh, you already have described on it you know different types of you know dalits uh, and uh, how do you you know see uh, you know scholars from you know dalit origin and the whole agenda of you know organic uh, intellectuals you know in gramscian framework as uh, you know ambedkar has really talked about uh, uh, in 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 the spoke ambedkar you know you find that you know uh, you know mission that you know noble is in your aim you know sublime and glory is your mission you know you, you have to commit yourself for you know society so i could uh, you know professor jonle would uh, you know support this maybe uh, the intellectuals you know who came from milin college Oh, yeah. and siddharth college has a very significant contribution correct in terms of uh, you know fighting caste and then you know posing you know questions uh, you know to the state and to you know broader society as such so uh, uh, how do you locate you know uh, the dalit intellectuals and uh, in 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 that frame and uh, i mean what is happening to them in in universities as such uh because you know we find that uh, you know the cases of you know caste uh, you know discrimination and you know all those uh, you know do coexist uh, with you know some you know dalit scholars already there in higher education institution how do you see it uh what was the last point uh, ab about uh, intellectuals the dalit intellectuals and the caste you know discrimination which still exists. against them yeah oh against them and against students as well okay um yeah maybe your take on you know organic intellectuals you can okay. and dalit uh, dalit scholars i i think uh, yeah i think um um i mean ambedkar is so related to gramsci for example now gramsci was somebody who went to you know who was fighting against fascists and you know there was a very interesting critique of marx uh you know he and and, and through that he produced a theory see that's how it happens if you have if if you have a theory you deal with the theory you criticize the theory 
and then from that comes a new thought, and that's how Gramsci did. And, and Ambedkar also is on the similar parallels. You know, he's dealing with yeah. questions, and you know, the, the the kind of things Gramsci talks about, Ambedkar also does that. Mm. Sometimes he does in relation uh, to existing uh, uh, panopticon thinkers or activists or, or social reformers, and and sometimes he just creates his own new canon. Uh, but also, you know, he is he is he is vulnerable to his own ideas that could be critiqued very very prominently mm. and 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 in 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 that sense uh, what what are we the question should ask is what are we missing here mm. see millen college was somebody that was the brainchild of ambedkar and it produced new intellectuals who really shaped uh, through their language and phenomenal mn vankede gangadhar pantavne we had uh, janardhan wagmare i mean these are the generations i mean countable people that came about from this kind of in, also siddharth college in bombay and so forth yeah. The whole idea was like if you have educated class, that will then direct, and many of them did direct. You know. Yeah. Now, if you rely everything on intellectual class, that is also a fear that the the mm -hmm. the, the class also has a class interest, <laughs> and that those class mm -hmm. interests could work against the uh, benefit of other. And it's it's normal every class interest would have. And this is what Ambedkar thought, and that's why he used this phrase that these people that he expected uh, would would rally for the cause and you know contribute habituated him. Mm. Now that's just not Ambedkar. That's every other people who created this. Now Du Bois thought of talented tenth in mm. in America, you know, and he would lament that these people have just become subject of this petty clerical jobs, trying to just fill their own tummies and looking after their own family, and then giving up on the responsibility that society has given upon them. Mm. So that is there, and so organic intellectuals in that sense also manifest in what Foucault calls to subjective intellectuals. You mm. might not be intellectual always, but you might just. Uh, if, if, if a time comes, you become subject to intellectuals, and in many sense, Dalit academics have been two types of intellectuals. Is what I think. A, there have been there, there, there has been investment of uh, what we can call subjective intellectualism. Mm. They've dealt with the topics that came through it and 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 and, and, and professed it in a way uh, that then brought out phenomenal knowledge. Even in today, uh, the non-English hegemon. Continues, but the non-English sphere, especially from these communities, is profound. It's so deep, it's mm. so philosophical, it's so genuine. That and 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 if one is studying India or South Asia or in that sense the sense of marginalizations, you have to rely on these dictionaries and 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 their ideas. And and there are so many names that one can just keep on counting. Mm. Um, but to just to to look at, especially the scholars uh, uh, who are alive, you know, there is a great legacy and diverse discipline. You can uh, Gopal Guru, uh, Rav Sahib Kasbe, yeah. Surendra Jolde. Uh, we, we have Sukhdev Thorat, Anand, Anand Tel Tel Tumde. Tumde. Uh, Then we you can go to uh, uh, the Mores and Uttam Kamle, and and and, and, and if, who are alive? Uh, then the dead are many. And then if you go to down uh, to to Tamil Nadu, then you have uh, 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 Ravi Kumar. We have also Tirumavalan who writes, but also there is a guy called uh, uh, Lenin, another Dalit scholar there. Yeah. Um, so if 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 you, if you keep on surpassing, and if you go to Karnataka, Devanur Madhava exists. If you go to the Hindi sphere, Dr. Rajiv Prasad Singh is there, uh, Kamal Bharti is there, um, uh, uh, you have Mohandas Nameshrai, uh, who is pro who's, who's providing intellectual uh, discourse and knowledge in Rajasthan sphere, M. L. Pariyar, who writes incredibly. Then you have uh, Bhagwar Bhavar Meghwanshi. Now, mm. now you see the names are abound uh, in, in, in Telugu sphere, of course, uh, phenomenal. Our Shudras Ka scholar, uh, Professor Kanche Laya, yeah. with, with him, uh, there is an uh, entire, entire generation. Of, of scholars that have come about through through this. Now they are writing in their, of course, English, but they are writing mostly in in their local languages. And these thought that are coming out of it is is more than what we call organic intellectuals. It is actually what we can call a true intellectual, mm. because there need not be an adjective that could define their position. And what true intellectual I mean is that they have stood ground to their own vocation and their own calling mm. through their own experience, mm. and then they thought about. How to how to provide that, um, and and, um, yeah. and they have done they have done incredible jobs. But not all of these people mm. that I've called these are mostly and all of them are university professors. Yes, many yeah. of them have had a patronage of institution, but there are many who have had no support of an institution and yet produced incredible knowledge. Those are what I would call subjective intellectuals who are far profound, uh, who are equally if not more. Um, mm -hmm. They're deep in, 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 in their analysis of society. And I think this is what it takes. You did not go to necessarily have a discipline training. You just need to have an interest in the topic and then put the, your subjectivity 
in, in, into this and subjectivity does not mean you cannot be objective. Of course, you sometimes miss out on that objective part, but objective and subjective notions remain in this. So, intellectualism mm. is not just the kind of what we have inbred intellectual. In India, caste system, the, the, the born intellectualism is what we have. If you are a Brahmin, you are born to educate or you are born to learn and, and so you are supposed to be this. This challenges the whole idea of how people who are working on the field or working or thinking about this and that is why their thinking is what is diagonal intellectualism. They are thinking diagonally, they are not thinking yeah. of straight action and diagonal intellectualism what these people are providing through the arc of these two other forms of true and, 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 and uh, uh, subjective intellectualism is what we see happening in the Dalit community. Yeah. So, uh, maybe we can take, uh, you know, some questions. Yeah. 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 10 minutes. 10 minutes. That's given. fine. That's yeah. fine. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Mayuri. Uh, uh, it is just related to do what we have been discussing. When we are talking about uh, Dalit intellectuals in terms of Gramscian uh, concept of uh, uh, the other Organic intellectuals. Uh, do you think there is a need to guard ourselves against the essentialist logic? Of course. Because uh, there are also um, the scholars from so called Savarna caste, like mm. for example, we have Dr. Sharmila Regi who have been writing of course. about the caste issue, and there has been a lot of debate whether, whether Brahmin should write on Dalit issues Correct. or who yeah. should be writing on Dalit issues, and uh, what is your take on that? I mean, I think I already critiqued the whole idea of yeah. uh, in, in, in my previous submission that we need not mm. uh, wholesomely rely on this. Yes. That's why I provided exactly. this other arcs of knowledge that might not necessarily have patronage or something of that sort. That's why I created this this notion of uh, the whole what I call, and this might sound again, you know, kind of weird kind of location, but uh, one who can have this diagonal kind of perspectives, and, 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 and that's why. I was like looking beyond the idea of organic intellectual. What you mm. know? What does it mean? So it kind of essentializes that a certain organic thought needs to come up from a certain frame of experience and mind, which is fine. You know, organic intellectualism can exist, but there exist many, many, many divergences, uh, uh, divergences that we see through the process, and that's why um, um, uh, how how we how we theorize intellectualism is it meant to create a canon? Is it meant to create a new discipline? Mm. Is it meant to contribute to the existing? A contribution could be just by contribution or, or negation. That still is contribution. Critique. Or is the new intellectualism <coughs> meant to uh, provide um, a self critique? So, if intellectualism is divided into <coughs> these parts, then we can easily understand where it is going. If it is establishing a canon, then it meets the the, the canonical thinkers we have, we cite them profoundly, and you know it could be anything. So yeah, I know we are running short of time, but very, very briefly, if you could just to relate this, I'm expanding it. You know, uh, I've seen U.S. or Indian scholars. You cannot be a scholar unless you are coming from a background of a lived reality. Yeah, yeah. Whether true. it is now people in India think there are Indic scholars, you know, in, in U.S. Americans yeah. who write about it the Veda. There's fierce resistance to that. You cannot be a real scholar. Similarly. Uh, an Indian, uh, suppose a Hindu writing about Islam, you cannot be, you don't, it's, it's, so do you, what, how, do we, how do we understand this? I mean, is it the scholar has to have lived reality of, as a background or you just can't, is it, or this? No, no, depends on what discipline it is. As the discipline changes, the kind of uh, approach to it changes. Now, if you are studying a, a theology as a perspective of, uh, of, 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 of philosophy, uh, then this exercise did not have lived reality because you are engaging with existing texts and the textual it is more a hermeneutic practice it is mm. more like detailing divulging and, and you know is what I think. But if you are writing an anthropology of Hinduism yes, exactly. then you certainly need to be part of that mm. because you are writing yes. about communities you are writing about people yes. and when you bring people as a subject then you need to have the reality of experience. It is like if I am writing about a topic, let us say marine life and if I have not as a scientist, if I have not engaged in marine life, if I have not studied them intimately, then really my uh, mm. uh, outcome is going to be different than if I am to write about Matsya uh, 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 Vidnyan by drawing on some you know 
uh, some existing uh, texts. So, if you are writing about people, especially vulnerable people, it is better to let the vulnerable people speak and write because their understanding is not going to confined with trying to be nice or trying to settle the structure or trying to adjust. They are going to just say how painful it is to work in a heat where the sun is scorching on your top of the head and at the end of the day, even if you fall, you might not even have any medical care. You might die and nobody is going to take notice of it. So, if that person writes, they are going to write it the way they feel it is right. And for mm -hmm. them to write it that way, we need to create support system. Now, when a person is in this index scholar context, right, uh, people writing about different, you know. Now, if, if, if you are writing purely in the sense of the index history, there is appreciation if you celebrate index history, if you are a foreign scholar, you are given a visas and passports of this country. But if you are a critical, like let us say Wendy Doniger, you are not critical, you are just writing what you observe, <laughs> then you are a criminal, then you are somebody who is not appreciated in this context because you know what, you are a white woman. But then the same white women and men who are celebrating the Indic values are now part of the, the new mission that the government or, the, or, the, or this ideology is established. And this applies to anybody, it is just not the thing of Indic, it applies to every other community and group who is doing that, you know, and, and, and this easily reducible debate. But if a scholarship is undergone through a good peer review mm. examination, if it comes about, then we have to respect the scholarship. We might not respect the results, we might not respect mm. the person, but scholarship has to have a status of engagement and appreciation. You might reject it, that is your fine, but scholarship is a knowledge, it is established. And now, if you might want to critique it, yes, mm. that is fine. But today what we do is, we use the groundswell, we use the pamphlets, pamphleteering, we use the commentary as knowledge, which does not exist. Mm. A people writing something somewhere needs to be scrutinized strictly. And if you work in a discipline and if you are publishing scholarly papers, you know, you write idea one now, you would think about an idea now, you might put the pen to paper after several research. Next year, it might go to review and by the time you are writing, it is coming to paper, it is all the three, four years. That is the status of a scholarship. If the scholarship has undergone that rigor, there is no hesitation for us to engage with it. Does not mean you have to accept it, but at least there is a, 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 a but you also do not need to demonize the scholar who has done it. Mm. A scholar is after all somebody who is writing and reporting on what was existing, what they have observed in the society. I am talking about mostly social science discipline here, just in case. Um, and, and, and in that sense, when a scholar is contributing to something, we need to have a sense of acknowledgement, but the people who are negating this have themselves never undergone the process of of peer review or rigor or, or what it takes to write a, a good scholarship. Mm. These are the people who are engaging in academia as a sense of mental engagement and having a, um, uh, and when I say mental engagement, what I mean is, they just want to have this idea level conversation. Mm. They are not really, they are they're, they're, they're out there to have this, uh, this new knowledge for the sake of learning. But if you really want to contribute to it, then you have to follow the process and then of course, you might get rejected. Many of us have yeah. got rejected. does not mean it is it's, it's less of your scholarship, it is just that, that you have to work more or probably you are just not in the right domain. That is not existing unfortunately, Ajit, in today's times. People with mediocre understanding of issues have become the people who are deciding what is right and what is wrong. People who do not even have a, and I do not mean to use, you need to have degree to have an understanding. I am not supporting of that mm -hmm. idea. But at least you need to have basic standards checked. When you are critiquing others, mm. when you are critiquing scholarly person, you need to at least have those minimum basic. You do not need to be equivalent of that person, need not. You can have your critique. But at least you have to have qualified for more bare minimum standards and what those are is mm. at least you have engaged seriously on this topic for several decades, engaged and disengaged with scholars in the field and take what scholarly community is saying. Unless and until your peers approve of you, you never go any far. Today's people are targeting, calling us people who deal with this are anti-nationals, mm. people as if this nation belongs to their grandfather, as to we are saying something that, you know, this whole idea of reductive, reductivism has come about. Scholarship is not about reductivism. You have to understand, please, students, you have to realize, it is not about reductivism. It is about going deep into the mm. topic and yet not come satisfied. It is like, yeah. I have gone this and I have only, I've, I could have, oh, oh. 
history yes it can remain open to interpretation but when you deal with human beings when it's a writing of literature when it's a writing uh, of of that reads that leads to a uh, person's uh, 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 visceral viscerality the visceral experience then that needs to be of course people from belong to certain community need to write mm. and and they, and they need to be advocates of that because what do i know if i have to write about a issue that doesn't really relate to me how can i write about africans uh, even though i am an africanist i identify myself and and write as an african i cannot of course i can write a thesis of what it what i observed african communities are doing oh. and this is what it is but i cannot declare that this is how Afri africans continue to live for their life that will just be a shorthand explanation and 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 that's why in today's context especially the younger generation faculty also need to be careful that they 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 have to be responsible enough to 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 tell that knowledge remains supreme emotion mm. and citation can be the secondary aspect of that mm. and if you need to work with 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 idea of emotion you will come up with praising or or denigrating mm. if you come with the idea of citation you will just engage in a certain politics Mm. think of knowledge and think of my responsibility and if you are really working in a certain field think that your knowledge should contribute to the welfare of other people and not making an egotistic statement that will support my supremacy over other mm. your knowledge should contribute of course to rationality and rationality sometimes mm. could not necessarily agree with one statement or the other it can disagree you might come across as a infamous scholar your <laughs> understanding might be like oh you are calling tribal people this or dalit people this that's what your knowledge has given to you and you think this is what it is you can also say might not be correct but this is what my understanding has been but if you are going out there with a project of knowledge to be supporting emancipation and liberation of people and society not just human beings but also non human beings that are existing amidst us plants trees and so forth then you are a responsible person but doesn't mean you have to compromise your scholarly acumen in this mm. you have to be more subtle more sharp and forthright as well and of course be open mm. if i'm working in a community that i don't belong to i'm going to be criticized that just going to come to you anyway it's just not scholarship even if you belong to a different uh, colony you go to a different colony and talk something else they're going to beat you or they're going to just <laughs> criticize you because you're coming this is this how simple it is yeah. it's it's more people are saying you don't live here so you don't know what it means to have an experience in this gully you live because you have this so just have that basic decency and understanding before we really go about thinking about knowledge yeah it's a more anthropological question and <laughs> the the, the legitimacy <laughs> huh legitimacy and yes, the yes. anthropological question any questions here yeah. uh, let's take few of them together two, and i'll two, give a final two, statement two three yes sneha yeah can they introduce themselves yes uh, uh, sneha my name is sneha uh, my question is little different from what we are ta talking right now so it is regarding the dalit movement in today's time so my question to you is uh, today we could see the lack of leadership among the dalit movement So, what are the child contemporary challenges, and how could we overcome those challenges? Correct. Regarding. Yeah. P please ask them to introduce. Uh, yeah, she is. You introduce yourself. My name is Sneha. Okay. Yeah. I'm a, yeah, a PhD is. scholar at uh, Google. Institute. Correct. And what was Moyuri? What she does? She 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 is working here. She's, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to have this because I've never. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Sneha. Thanks. Collect some questions. Yeah. Cool. Let's collect yeah. you. So let uh, we'll collect some questions. Yes. Hello sir, Jai Bhim. Jai Bhim. So my name is Gunesh Kambey. I am done my graduation in BA Political Science. So sir, my question is like yesterday uh, we discussed that uh, caste is a moral and a psychological concept for sure. And so hence we can say that it is going to be here for a mere long time, little longer time. And with that, consequently, we also see that the reservation policy would also stay. So sir, we being as a Dalit. Uh, who are benefited by this reservation policy in education, politics, and jobs? So, sir, what can be set as a threshold or a limit, or let's say, what is the desired scenario wherein we voluntarily start condensing the use of reservation? So, can, sir, like, can we also see a day on 25th of December, like we celebrate Manusmriti Dhan Divas? Mm. On that day, we can we also start the burning of caste certificates, something like that? <laughs> Good one. Yeah. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. Jaybin sir. Jaybin. My name is Avantika Karade. Uh, I'm from Garchiroli. Uh, I passed my graduation last year from Modern College uh, in BA Economics. And uh, in September, uh, this in tech, I'm going to do my masters in London School of Economics. Uh, so my question to you is. Uh, 
good one. So, uh, one fine day on uh, 15th March, uh, on birthday of Kanshram ji, uh, I suddenly asked my father, uh, Papa, uh, huh. what happened during the time, the era, the post era after Ambe Dr. Ambedkar, mm -hmm. and uh, before the era, uh, before uh, early uh, early 1970s and 1980s, mm -hmm. when Kanshram ji and uh, his co-founder, um, DK Khabarde uh, founded BAMSEF and B BSP. Hmm. So, uh, what was the Ambedkarite movement? Was it a st uh, in a steel period, or is there a movement between uh, uh, between those eras? Hmm. Um, and uh, my father actually couldn't answer this question, uh, <laughs> and so he uh, reverted this question to you to ask you. And I would like <laughs> if you to appreciate this question and answer it. What was the? It's a. So the period between uh, after Ambedkar movement, uh, when uh, he took Dhamma Diksha at Nagpur, uh, there were thousands Ambedkar. of people who take Dhamma Diksha with him. But uh, after that, uh, the movement was not so strong. And we can see in uh, early 80s and 90s, we see Kanshiram ji and uh, Khapade sir, uh, who have actually uh, participated in the Ambedkarite movement and uh, led the uh, the community uh, very strongly and firmly. But during those time, uh, I am not sure what actually uh, really happened on the ground. Correct, correct, understood. And uh, I want you to yeah. answer this question. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So Maharashtra's politics. Huh? Maybe. Let's take yes, a last uh, one. Any, anyone? Yeah. yeah. Good, uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is Suraj. Joki Samaj mein abhi hum modern India ki baat karte hai. Hamare Samaj mein abhi bhi wo caste, caste based par jo discrimination hota hai aur jo bhi ghatne karti hai. जैसे कि राजस्थान में इंद्र में गोल की हो गई अगर आप मतलब दलित जो चैनल है जो चैनल प्रेजेंट कर दे कि जो घटनाएं घट रही है तो मेरा सवाल ये है कि घटनाएं घट रही है उनको सजाएं मिल रही है फिर भी इसका रिजल्ट क्या है अगर उनको पता ही नहीं है घटनाएं घट के घट रही है कर रहे हैं उनको पनिशेबल है लेकिन इसका रिजल्ट होना चाहिए सब कुछ तो कि कुछ चेंज होना चाहिए अगर आपने बात की है कि मन जो मन में जो हमारे भाई जो कास्ट बैठी हुई है उसको चेंज करने में कितना समय लगेगा और यह सही में सोसाइटी से जो विलेज में ये सही में विलेज से ये कास्ट चली जाएगी क्या सर या मे बी शॉर्ट या या यू इंट्रोड्यूस योर सर माय नेम इज सुमित आई एम करेंटली वर्किंग इन एन एनजीओ इन हेल्थ सेक्टर आई वाज अ स्टूडेंट ऑफ बोकले इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ प्रशांत सर स्टूडेंट सो आई वांटेड टू नो व्हाट वाज यू नो अंबेडकर्स व्यू ऑन लैंड रिफॉर्म पर्टिकुलरली यू नो व्हेन यू सेड दैट ही वाज नॉट अलाइन विद गांधीज आईडिया ऑफ ग्राम स्वराज वुड यू नो लैंड रिफॉर्म्स वुड हैव बीन एबल टू क्रिएट मोर इक्वल सोसाइटी वेयर लाइक वन कम्युनिटी इज नॉट टोटली डिपेंड ऑन ऑन अदर कम्युनिटी इकोनॉमिकली एंड आल्सो when we now see that uh, south asian countries who have had land reforms immediately after independence have shown a tremendous economic growth and a more equal society so, so it doesn't just make social logical sense but also economic sense yeah. so just wanted to know america's view on uh, land reforms yeah. there are so diverse questions it's very difficult i think that question uh, deserves a, a seminar where i can come <laughs> and then you know give give, give the give yeah, the give the come. give we the detail on and, 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 and land, on land reform <laughs> because it's a, it's a very interesting very deep but also there are multiple archives that talk about agrarian reform and ambedkar's contribution to that and you know that's much appreciated some of the work ambedkar couldn't do in his life and in many ways he was insufficient in completing one of that was land reforms he was his idea but didn't really he couldn't really take it to its end because you know and i think if ambedkar had taken land reform part of his movements early on mm. then probably ambedkar would have been a much bigger hero except marwatan uh, except which Maharvatan. which he did here yeah. in, in in the whole idea Konkan. of khoti again was konkan and was 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 was, was not really a strict sense land reform yeah. it was yeah. meant to uh, end the reliance of yeah. on, on on the yeah. on the khot khot the, the whole idea marwatan was you were given certain uh, jobs that were belonging to you and you did that and so he abolished that and of course uh, that was because rr R. bhole was somebody who 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 made a big role so so that some of the things that i think uh, needed to be done pretty much in advance but of course uh, if you are dealing in a state politics then you have to uh, also find ways so he could do whatever he could and i think his people who believe in him any any caste and community need to take that on um, i think um, uh, you know uh, how how do we how do we uh, how do you think about ambedkarite politics after independence uh, uh, that her question was there and i think 
the young gen gentleman also asked the question about how long should we, you know, uh, keep on carrying the caste certificates and, you know, let's just burn it. And I think that's, you know, one can think in various ways about this question. And there not, might not be one particular correct response to this. Mm. And I think that's why I invite you to think and, and do what you think yourself might be the right way. Because let not one prescription become the ultimate solution. So if you think that is the way of going about, you know, by all means, uh, if, you, if you are confident enough to think that I don't want to do with this and I don't want to rely on this and this, and you could do it because you might be second or third generation. But the first generation don't have any resources. They have to rely on the state, not just Dalits or anybody. Mm. State is their protector. But if you are coming from a family who your father and mother has job and you have had a certain upbringing and you don't feel like needed, do it. You know, it doesn't, doesn't hurt. Mm. It, it, is, it is what you think. Uh, and, and do it not because you feel emotional about it, but do it because you have enough resources to, to self-protect and, and carry on. And many people, uh, um, uh, you know, when we grew up in, in this deeply unequal society, uh, many parents, especially Dalit parents, don't tell their kids about their own caste. They don't tell anything about the history because they themselves have not been educated about the glorious history and the pride and they live interpretations. What you do is most of the time you switch on a TV, or, or read a magazine, and there you all see is denudation. They always say is mockery. They always see is uh, is 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 withdrawing of your own self conscious and pride. And that's why the parents live in the self hatred inferiority complexes, and they feel like my kids don't they don't want to go into that. That's their unfortunate part. They couldn't really mm. impart, you know. And that's the failure of the young Dali generation. They couldn't do this pride historical uh, 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 retelling of history, and that's why some of the things. I will do because your parents never did was to including my parents and so forth was was to impart that positive knowledge and affirmation and how great people you are nobody told you people always told you how inferior you are how 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 irresponsible how much you rely on government for your own funding and you know and you live you lived in self hatred because sometimes this comes not because of you because somebody told you that you are not capable enough mm -hmm. and 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 that's why many people change their last names and and and, and they said I don't want to deal with it but that didn't stop the caste discrimination. Of course, it, it decreased to a certain level. In Uttar Pradesh, they have last name Kumars. In Sikh faith, everybody is Singh, but people started adding their own last names as well. So that kind of added up. Um, and, and, and today, in, the, in one way, for a non-people, if, if there is a Kishore or a Kumar, it is a very, we don't know what the caste of the person is. And so, in, in sometimes, when you deal with this, you might not know. And so it might work in, 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 in some way. And, but also, it, you know, it's not an ultimate solution. What do you do? You just you just insert pride about it that I belong to this community. There's nothing wrong in that. I am proud of what I am. I'm proud of my ancestors. They never, they never wanted to this country to go to dogs. They fought for it. They've been deeply patriotic. They have been concerned about how to bring equality to everybody. They've never stolen from anybody else. They've always tried to distribute whatever they could get. They've always relied on the good of others and tried to teach us also to believe in the humanity of other people without them having to give the opportunity for you to express your true self. You have to, unless somebody tells you this, you continue to live in the deep uh, uh, seated inferiorities. And that's what has happened in many senses. And so if you need to get rid of that, you need to develop new things. Uh, finally, over the Ambedkarite poll, what happened with Kanshiram? I think um, 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 it, Kanshiram remains an interesting topic for me because how could he do that, right? I mean, you know, one of the things, you know, successes and, and even yesterday Girish was saying, you know, fine, Kanshiram did that, but what happened after that? And that's a valid question also, you know. Mm. We can live in a romantic nostalgia. The, the most successful Dalit politician ever was Kanshiram. He surpassed Ambedkar as well. Ambedkar couldn't be successful mm. electorally, at, at least electro, electorally. He lived in Pune. Uh, uh, yes, Kanshiram had yeah. a history of Pune. I just want to point out, and yes, Pune was his... You know, he kept he kept coming to Pune also for various conventions and and you know, so Ambedkar miserably failed in electoral politics. Mm. He was not as successful. Kanshiram was somebody who could do that. That sense of confidence only Kanshiram like person could think. Other people still lived in inferities. They still mm. their benchmark was still the electoral politics of Ambedkar. Kanshiram went beyond that. Ambedkar was his ideological, but he was never his electoral. Uh, kind of competence because he had relied that he would have just distributed compromise seats. I'll just give an example what he did. When the politics 1960s elections, uh, uh, 1962, 
elections were taking place, um, the very <laughs> radical group among the Ambedkar and after Ambedkar died uh, was Scheduled Caste Federation. They separated and they, of course, started Republican Party of India. One of the group was Dada Sahib Gaikwad, who was a guy who was very, you know, worked for land rights and he said, mm -hmm. I will never. Yeah. Um, uh, Uttam Kamli writes about that actually. Uh, that BC Kamli. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are many groups, but yeah. one of the group was Dada Sahib Gaikwad, uh, who was who said when Ambedkar died that I will never <laughs> let this movement go. Baba Sahib, very emotional charge and stuff like that. I think uh, a few years later, he compromised with Congress for one seat, and 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 and, and the Dalits got only one seat, and the rest were Congress. They, they fought in coalition. Now such a humiliation to a giant called Ambedkar, where you could only get one seat. For electing con for contesting elections, what Kanchiram did, Kanchiram went to Uttar Pradesh. Three decades later, made an ally, Congress made an Congress his ally, and gave them in ally, gave them only 120 or 30 seats, and the rest 300 plus seats took to himself. Now people <laughs> criticize him. See, you are going with the Congress. His response was, Congress humiliated Ambedkar by just giving one seats. I have taken the revenge there by giving them minimum seats and I am having the majority seats. That is the kind of political thinking a winner, a victor or a king has. These <laughs> inferiority complex petty politicians never could think like that. They never could work out the solution. He said, Baba Sahib ke uh, uh, ka badla mene Uttar Pradesh mein ja ke liya. And he, and he said, and people questioned him, how can you ally with the Congress? And these are the people who have never studied how political electoral democracy works. And this extremely uh, 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 dangerous so-called, who call themselves scholars and, and uh, scholarship means you have to start scholar. The position of scholarship starts with critical thinking. They never criticize. They just wrote books in Payan. How <laughs> great this guy is, how great this leader is, how great this uh, poet is. They could never think critically. Kanchi Ram had the ability and probably because he lived in Punjab, he came from Punjab and stuff like that, the people here could not really think beyond that. Kanchi Ram could think about how can I do better by making use of the politics. So, when they were criticizing Kanchi Ram that you are allying with Congress and stuff like that, he said, I am allying with Congress because I want to end Congress, which he did. Rahul Gandhi just last year said, because of Kanchi Ram, we have lost our fort in, 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 in Uttar Pradesh. There is no Congress in Uttar Pradesh now. So, Kanchi Ram made sure that he, he would do that. That kind of political big thinking will only come with people if you think of yourself as Victor, who really relies on history. The people in Maharashtra politics especially, especially the so-called writers and scholars and, 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 and especially belong to the Dalit community, living with immense amount of inferiority. And they were scholars of someone's court. They were not independent. I am not talking about everybody. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, just be careful about that. I am talking about those. And people who took positions they became permanent member of those ideological positions. That does not work. Kanshiram went across the lines to find a niche because if you are a minority, that too an oppressed minority, you need to find ways to find a political uh, 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 stamina to sustain. And I think that is why Kanshiram remained and, and probably he was the most feared politician when he was alive. And I am writing a kind of, I am working on his, I am collecting his speeches. And, and, and not speech, but writings he wrote in English, profoundly English guy, you know. I am um, bringing out a Kanchiram reader, hopefully uh, in a year or two, where we are going to, you are going to get what mm. Kanchiram means and how he also said, if Brahmins tokenize Dalits, why do not I tokenize Brahmins? And that is what he did. Mm. You can only think it like that when you are a part of, when you think of yourself as running as a uh, thing. Why, uh, why is always Dalit? Uh, or Adivasi uh, becoming uh, 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 an agent of a Brahminical party. He said, mm. I will reverse the game still. And then he brought Brahmins into his political party. And all these petty minded people did not even realize his vision. They started criticizing him for uh, his bringing Brahmins and all. At the end of the day, the project was to win the elections. And elections is about uh, not uh, 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 political morality. Indian elections are meant to have an electoral, because it is first past the post system, so you have to utilize. So, this man could think, no one else in Maharashtra, at least from the, any community who is from the SCST, OBC community or minority could think of the, what Kanchiram could do. And then of course, he remains the victor of his times and continues to 
uh, be uh, having a unique monumental position of Dalit politics, uh, where at times you could buy Dalit politicians. Now you had to request and beg for Dalit votes and Dalit politics. This is the great contribution Kanchi Ram did that no other leader uh, after Ambedkar could do. And I think that's why uh, Kanchi Ram's enigma continues to continues to uh, 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 continues to be alive. Mm. His descendants or what are they doing? The what it's supposed to do? Every political epoch has different urgency. Mm. Now you cannot expect a Mayawati who was in her 30s and 20s and 40s was advocating radically because of her age and all to be the same that you are expecting now. Political age changes with political needs. Mm. Now the needs are different. So people are still trying to find out easy solution, blaming Mayawati for that. She did what she could in her lifetime. Now what you could do and what you can do is something question I think people should ask for themselves. Maybe you know Maharashtra's you know politics. Uh, yeah, maybe you know because of Maharashtra's politics has limited to certain caste. Uh, maybe you know Maharashtra's uh, Dalit politics has limited to some caste, whereas you know Kanchiram could uh, you know uh, take it to you know different caste, Correct. Yatavas and you know uh, others, and also he has you know what what you say is the social engineering yeah. you know amongst you know different castes so maybe his uh, legacy of uh, you know becoming uh, acquiring you know political power Correct. for you know social change is more important absolutely. that's what christoph talks about absolutely in his book so i i just want final to question yeah, we'll take. yeah final question from professor john lay lot of young students and they are very much interested to know your personal academic life. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Maybe two minutes on it. But yesterday I gave already. Kal bolu. Kal bolu. Kal bolu. Kal bolu. I think I spoke about that question yesterday yeah. uh, in detail. Especially, I also skipped that and then Girish made sure, even though there was no time that I that I talk about. It will take some time. Unfortunately, I will have to. Uh, forgo because it's it's you, you know I can't just say I just wake, woke up one day and just decided <laughs> to go. It has to have a uh, discussion. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah of course. Uh, uh, but I think uh, 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 what do you want to? Uh, I think, no, I think uh, yeah, it, it's just. it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Maybe I take uh, you know uh, maybe I take this opportunity from uh, uh, him and then that you have already accepted to have you know come for a seminar. So maybe uh, Ambedkar on the land question, maybe we have you know some you know, seminar or a workshop, and maybe I I, I consider that you are in for it. <laughs> on behalf of the Bhopal Institute of Politics and Economics, I would like to extend my gratitude to everyone who has made this program possible. I would like to first of all thank our Vice Chancellor Dr. Ranade and the Dean of Faculty Dr. Balsore for arranging this interaction. I would further like to thank Dr. Yengde for agreeing to be a part of this interaction. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Your remarks today were really insightful for us. I would also like to thank all the teaching and non-teaching staff who have directly and indirectly contributed to this event. A special thanks to our uh, communications officer, Mr. Akash Gulandar, and our office superintendent, Mr. Ram Krishna Gohle. Lastly, I extend my thanks to all of you for being here in Kale Hall and uh, patiently listening to this interaction. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you.